Because, Alain went on, you haven't done so yet, you know. I shall not make any further statements. I prefer to remain silent. Shall I tell you what I think may have happened last night? I think that when you arrived at Hammer Farm at five past one this morning, you knew already that Colonel Carteret was dead. You let us understand that you returned to the Bottom Meadow just before you came to Hammer Farm at about one o'clock, but your coat was as dry as a chip, so it must have been much earlier in the evening before the rain that you returned to the bridge in the hope of retrieving the fish and found it gone. Mrs. Carteret reached Hammer Farm at about five past eight, and Dr. Lacklander went home at eight fifteen. Neither of them saw the trout. On my working hypothesis, then, you revisited the valley after 8.15 and, one would suppose, before a quarter to nine when Nurse Kettle did so. And there, Mr. Finn, in the Willow Grove, you found Colonel Carteret's dead body, with your mammoth trout beside it. And didn't Nurse Kettle very nearly catch you in the Willow Grove? Has she said— No, Alain said, not specifically. It is I who suggest that you hid and watched her and crept away when she had gone. I suggest, moreover, that when you bolted for cover, your reading spectacles were snatched from your hat by an envious sliver, and that in your panic you dared not look for them. Then you saw the lights of Hammer Farm, and you couldn't endure the suspense of not knowing if the colonel had been found. Alain drew a pair of spectacles from the breast pocket of his coat. I'm afraid I can't let you have them back just yet, but he extended his long finger towards Mr. Finn's breast pocket. Isn't that a magnifying glass you have managed to unearth? Mr. Finn was silent. Well, Alain said, there's our view of your activities. It's a picture based on your own behavior and one or two known facts. If it is accurate, believe me, you will be wise to say so. You are a very clever man. I... I found him because of the howl of his dog. Mr. Finn shut his eyes very tight. Even though his hat was over his face, one knew at a glance. I didn't go near, but I saw my fish, my superfin. And then, you know, I heard her, kettle, stump, 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 past the willow grove. I ran, I flung myself on my face in the undergrowth and waited until she had gone. And then I came home, said Mr. Finn, and, as you have surmised, I discovered the loss of my reading glasses, which I frequently kept in my hat band. I was afraid. And there you are. Yes, Alain said. There we are. And you are still disinclined to tell us the full substance of your discussion with Colonel Carteret? Mr. Finn nodded. Fox picked up the parcel of clothes. Alain said, We'll call later for a statement, or perhaps you'd bring one to the police station in Chining this evening. Very well, Mr. Finn swallowed. Grand. We mustn't bother you any longer. Goodbye, then, until, shall we say, five o'clock in Chining? They went out by a side door and down the garden to the spinney. Here Sergeant Oliphant waited for them, Alain's homicide bag beside him. At the sound of their voices he turned and they saw that across his palms there lay a sheet of newspaper. On the newspaper were the dilapidated remains of a trout. I got her, said Sergeant Oliphant. She was a short piece about the bridge on the side. Cat's work, sir, as you can see by the teeth marks. As we supposed. Now blow me down flat if this isn't the answer to the good little investigating officer's prayer. Under Oliphant's enchanted gaze, he opened his case, took from it a flat enamel dish and a small glass jar with a screw-on lid. Using his tweezers, he spread out the piece of skin with the triangular gap on the plate. From the glass jar, he took the piece of skin that had been found on the sharp stone under the olden. Muttering and whistling under his breath, and with a delicate dexterity, he pushed and fiddled the one into the other as if they were pieces of a jigsaw puzzle. They fitted exactly. And that, Alain said, is why Mrs. Twitchit met us last night smelling of fish, when she should have been stinking of liver. You've done damned handily, Sergeant, to pick this up so quickly. Now listen, and I'll explain. The explanation was detailed and exhaustive. Alain ended it with an account of the passage he had read in Colonel Carteret's book. "'We'll send out a signal to some piscatorial pundit,' he said, and get a check. But if the colonel was right, our two trout cannot exhibit identical scales. The colonel's killer handled both fish. Sergeant Oliphant cleared his throat, and with an air of modest achievement, stooped behind a briar-bush. "'There is one other matter, sir. I found this at the bottom of the hill in a bit of underbrush.' He straightened up. In his hand was an arrow. It appears, he said, to have blood on it. Does it indeed? 
Alain said, and took it. All right, Oliphant, damn good show. Drive Mr. Fox to the station where he will ring the yard and the Natural History Museum. Deliver your treasure trove to Dr. Curtis. I hope to have the rest of the exhibits before this evening. Come on, chaps, this case begins to ripen. He saw Oliphant and Fox on their way and himself climbed up the hill to Nun's Pardon. Here, to his surprise, he ran into a sort of party. Shaded from the noontide sun on the terrace before the great house were assembled the three Lacklanders, Kitty Carteret and Rose. It was now half-past twelve, and a cocktail tray gave an appearance of conviviality to a singularly wretched-looking assembly. Kitty, in a tweed suit, high heels and embroidered gloves, was talking to George. Before she noticed Alain, she had completed a sentence, and he had heard it. That's right, she said. Briley and Brentwood. And then she saw him, and made an abrupt movement that drew all their eyes upon him. They've been having a council of war, thought Alain. Well, Rory, Lady Lacklander shouted, you don't give us much peace, do you? What do you want this time? The clothes off our backs? Yes, Alain said. I'm afraid I do. The clothes off your yesterday evening backs, if you please. Do you mean, Lady Lacklander said, the clothes that we were all wearing when Morris Carteret was murdered? I do, yes. Well, she said, you're welcome to mine. What was I wearing yesterday? Mark grinned at her. A green tent, I fancy, Gar, darling, a solar topee and a pair of grandfather's boots. You're perfectly right. I'll tell my maid Roderick and you shall have them. Thank you. Alain looked at Mark. I was wearing whites. I put brogues on for going home and carried my tennis shoes. And your racket? Yes. And after Bottom Bridge, Lady Lacklander's sketching gear and shooting stick. That's right. And Lady Lacklander had left it all tidily packed up, hadn't she? Well, Mark said with a smile at his grandmother, more or less. Nonsense, Lady Lacklander said. There was no more or less about it. I'm a tidy woman, and I left everything tidy. Mark opened his mouth and shut it again. Your paint rag, for instance, Alain said, and Mark glanced sharply at him. I overlooked the rag, certainly, said Lady Lacklander rather grandly, when I packed up, but I folded it neatly and tucked it under the strap of my haversack. Why have you put on that look, Mark? she added crossly. Well, darling, when I got there, the rag, far from being neatly folded and stowed, was six yards away on a briar bush. I rescued it and put it into your haversack. They all looked at Alain as if they expected him to make some comment. He was silent, however. I wish you joy of my skirt, Mr. Alain, Kitty said unexpectedly. You won't find it very delicious. No, Alain said. Why not? It absolutely reeks of fish. I tried to take a fish away from a cat last evening. The others gaped at her. Where did you meet your cat and fish, Mrs. Carteret? This side of the bridge. Looked a perfectly good trap to me, and I thought the cat had no business with it. I thought old Ocky Finn must have hooked it and given it to the cat. He's crazy enough on his cats to give them anything, isn't he, George? Good God, yes! It's a possible explanation, Alain said, as if it didn't much matter either way. I want to know if, when I arrived, you were discussing Sir Harold Lacklander's memoirs. He knew by their very stillness that he had scored. In point of fact, we were, she said. You must have extremely sharp ears. I caught the name of my own publishers, Alain said at once. Briley and Bentwood, an admirable firm. I'm glad you approve of them, she said dryly. I believe they are. Colonel Carteret was entrusted with the publication, wasn't he? There was a fractional pause before Mark and Rose together said, Yes, I'm glad Mr. Finn's not with us at the moment, because I want to ask you if Sir Harold gives a full account of young Finn's tragedy. Alain looked from one blankly staring face to another. Lady Lacklander said, I haven't read my husband's memoirs, nor I think has anyone else except Morris. Well, Alain said, I'm sorry to labour the point, but I should like to know, if you please, whether either Sir Harold Lacklander or Colonel Carteret ever said anything to any of you about the Ludovic Finn affair in connection with the memoirs. Damned if I see what you're getting at, George began. Damned if I see how you make out my father's memoirs can have anything to do with Maurice Carteret's murder. Alain said, it's eighteen years since young Ludovic Danbury Finn committed suicide and a war has intervened. Many people will have forgotten his story. One among those who have remembered it 
His father must dread above all things any revival, unless, of course, it has come about that in reviving the tragedy through the memoirs, young Finn's name will be cleared. It was as if, out of a cloth that had apparently been wrung dry, an unexpected trickle was induced. George, who seemed to be the most vulnerable of the group, shouted, You've no right to assume! and got no further. Almost simultaneously, Mark and Rose said, This won't do! and were checked by an imperative gesture from Lady Lacklander. Roderick! Lady Lacklander demanded. Have you been talking to Octavius Finn? Yes, Alain said. I've come straight here from Jacob's cottage. Wait a bit, Mama, George blurted out. Wait a bit! Octavius can't have said anything otherwise, don't you see? Alain wouldn't try to find out from us. In the now really deathly silence that followed this speech, Lady Lacklander turned and blinked at her son. You ninny, George, she said. You unfathomable fool. And Alain thought he now knew the truth about Mr. Finn, Colonel Carteret, and Sir Harold Lacklander's memoirs. Alain stood up. They all jumped slightly. I expect you would like, before taking any further steps, to consult with Mr. Finn. Perhaps when you have all come to a decision, you will be kind enough to let me know. They'll always take a message at the boy and donkey. And now, if I may, I'll get on with my job. He bowed to Lady Lacklander, was about to move off when Mark said, I'll see you to your car, sir. Coming, Rose? Mark and Rose conducted him round the east wing of the great house to the open platform in front of it. Here, Fox waited in the police car. A sports model with a doctor's sticker and a more domestic car, which Alain took to be Carteret's, waited side by side. The young footman emerged with a suitcase and delivered it to Fox. There goes our dirty washing, Mark said, and then looked uncomfortable. He caught Rose's hand in his. Mr. Allen, Mark said. Rose and I are in a hell of a spot over this, aren't we, darling? We're engaged, by the way. You amaze me, Allen said. Well, we are, and I feel strongly that as far as you and our two families are concerned, everything ought to be perfectly straightforward. We're under promise not to mention this and that, and so we can't. But you see, sir, we happen to know that poor old Oki Finn had every possible reason not to commit this crime. And you agree with this, Miss Carteret? Mr. Allen, my father would have been appalled if he could have known that because he and Octavius had had a row over the trout, poor Oki might be thought to, to have a motive. They'd had rows over the trout for years. It was a kind of joke, nothing, and... Whatever else they had to say to each other, and as you know there was something else, it would have made Octavius much more friendly, I promise you. You see, I'm sure he went to Oki's because I saw him take the envelope out of the desk and put it in his pocket. She put her hand to her eyes. But, she said, where is it then? Alain said. Where exactly was the envelope? In which drawer of his desk? I think the bottom one on the left. He kept it locked, usually. I see. Thank you. And, of course, Mr. Finn was not at home? No, I suppose finding him not at home, Daddy followed him down to the stream. Of course, I mustn't tell you what his errand was, but if ever— Rose said in a trembling voice. If ever there was an errand of, well, of mercy, Daddy's was one yesterday afternoon. Alain said gently, I know. Don't worry. I can promise we won't blunder. He turned to Mark. I think it might be a good idea if you drove Miss Carteret to Hammer Farm, where perhaps you will be kind enough to hunt up her own and Mrs. Carteret's garments of yesterday. Everything, please, shoes, stockings, and all. We'll follow you and collect them. Fair enough, Mark said. Alain watched them get into the sports car and shoot off down a long drive. He shook his head slightly and let himself into the front seat beside Fox. Follow them, Br'er Fox, he said. We're going to Hammer Farm. On the way, he outlined the general shape of his visit to Nun's Pardon. Now, my dear Br'er Fox, why should the Lacklanders, or Mr. Finn, or the Carterets be so uncommonly touchy about all this? I don't know what you think, but I can find only one answer. Fox turned the car sedately into the Hammer Farm Drive and nodded his head. Seems pretty obvious when you put it like that, Mr. Allain, I must say. But is there sufficient motive for murder in it? Who the hell's going to say what's a sufficient motive for murder? Hello, listen, who's coming? <laughs>
He was out of the car before Fox could reply, and with an abrupt change of speed began to stroll down the drive. His pipe was in his hands, and he busied himself with filling it. The object of this unexpected pantomime now paddled into Mr. Fox's ken, the village postman. "'Good morning,' said Alain. "'Morning, sir,' said the postman, breaking his bicycle. "'I'll take them, shall I?' Alain suggested. The postman steadied himself with one foot on the ground. "'Well, tar,' he said. "'Save the disturbance like, won't it, sir?' He fetched a long envelope from his bag and held it out. "'For the deceased,' he said in a special voice. "'Terrible sad, if I may pass the remark.' "'A very kind of you,' Alain said. "'I'll tell them you sent your sympathy.' When the postman had gone, Alain returned to Fox. Look what I've got, he said. Fox contemplated the long envelope, and when Alain showed him the reverse side, read the printed legend on the flap. From Briley and Bentwood, St. Peter's Place, London, W1. Publishers, said Fox. Yes, we've got to know what this is, Fox. The flap's very sketchily gummed down, a little tweak, and how easy it would be. However, we'll go the other way round. Here comes Miss Carteret. She came out, followed by Mark, carrying a suitcase, a tennis racket, inner press, and a very new golf bag and clubs. "'Here you are, sir,' Mark said. "'Thank you,' Alain said, and Fox relieved Mark of his load. Alain showed Rose the envelope. He said, "'This has come for your father. I'm afraid we'll have to ask for all his recent correspondence, and certainly for anything that comes now. They will, of course, be returned, and, unless used in evidence, will be treated as strictly confidential.' I'm so sorry, but that's how it is. If you wish, you may refuse to let me have this one without an official order. Rose looked at it without interest. Please take it, she said. It's a pamphlet, I should think. Alain thanked her and watched her go off with Mark in his car. He opened the envelope, drew out the enclosure, and unfolded it. Colonel M. C. V. Carteret, M. V. O. D. S. O. Hammer Farm, Swevenings. Dear Sir, the late Sir Harold Lacklander, three weeks before he died, called upon me for a discussion about his memoirs, which my firm is to publish. A difficulty had arisen in respect of Chapter 7, and Sir Harold informed me that he proposed to take your advice in this matter. He added that if he should not live to see the publication of his memoirs, he wished you, if you would accept the responsibility, to edit the work in toto. He asked me, in the event of his death, to communicate directly with you and with nobody else, and stressed the point that your decision in every respect must be considered final. We have had no further instructions or communications of any kind from Sir Harold Lacklander, and I now write, in accordance with his wishes, to ask if you have, in fact, accepted the responsibility of editing the memoirs, if you have received the manuscript, and if you have arrived at a decision in the delicate and important matter of Chapter 7. I shall be most grateful for an early reply. I am, my dear sir, yours truly, Timothy Bentwood. And I'll give you two guesses, Brer Fox, what constitutes the delicate and important matter of Chapter 7. At Chining Police Station, Sergeant Oliphant awaited them with two messages from Scotland Yard. Nice work, Alain said, damn quick. He read aloud the first message. Information read Trout Scales, checked with the Natural History Museum, Royal Piscatorial Society, Institute for Preservation of British Trout Streams, and Dr. S. K. M. Solomon, expert and leading authority, all confirm that microscopically your two trout cannot exhibit precisely the same characteristics in scales. Carteret regarded as authority. Fine, said Inspector Fox. Fair enough. Alain took up the second slip of paper. Report, he read, on the late Sir Harold Lacklander's will. He read to himself for a minute, then looked up. Couldn't be simpler, he said. With the exception of the usual group of legacies to dependents, the whole lot goes to the widow and to the son. Now for the third. Report on Commander Geoffrey Sice, R.N., retired, was based in Singapore at first, noticeably quiet, spent considerable time alone sketching, later cohabited with a Miss Kitty de Vere, whom he is believed to have met at a taxi dance. Sice rented apartment occupied by de Vere, who subsequently met and married Colonel Morris Carteret, to whom she is believed to have been introduced by Sice. Alain dropped the chit on Oliphant's desk. Poor Carteret, he said with a change of voice. And if you like poor Sice. Oh, from that point of view, Fox said, poor Kitty. Before they returned to Swebenings, Alain and Fox visited Dr. Curtis in the Chining Hospital mortuary. He was able to confirm that there had been an initial blow followed by a puncture. 
He would not entirely dismiss Commander Sice's arrows or Lady Lacklander's umbrella spike, but he thought her shooting stick the most likely of the sharp instruments produced. The examination of the shooting stick for blood traces might bring them nearer to a settlement of this point. The paint rag undoubtedly was stained with blood, which had not yet been classified. It smelt quite strongly of fish. Alain handed over the rest of his treasure trove. Soon as you can, he said. Do like a good chap, get on to the fishy side of the business. It's a pig of a case, and on second thoughts, I'll keep the other arrow, the bloody one, if it is blood. What the hell can I carry it in? I don't want him to— Ah, that'll do. He slung George Lacklander's golf bag over his shoulder, wrapped up the tip of Sice's arrow, and dropped it in. Pig of a case, he repeated. I hate its guts. Why this more than another? But Alain did not answer. He was looking at the personal effects of the persons under consideration. The colonel's and Mr. Finn's clothes, Kitty's tweed skirt, Sir George's plus fours, Lady Lacklander's sketching kit, and a pair of ancient but beautifully made brogues. Alain stopped, stretched out a hand, and lifted one of these brogues. Size about four, he said. He turned the shoe over and was looking at the heel. It carried miniature spikes. Alain looked at Fox, who, without a word, brought from the end of the shelf a kitchen plate on which were laid out the remains of the colonel's fish. The flap of skin with its fragment of an impression was carefully spread out. It'll fit all right, Alain said. Do your stuff, of course, but it's going to fit, and the better it fits, the less I'm going to like it. And with this illogical observation, he went out of the mortuary. What is biting him? Dr. Curtis asked Fox. Ask yourself, Doctor, Fox said. It's one of the kind that he's never got, as you might say, used to. Well, I'll leave you with your corpse. Seeing you, Dr. Curtis said absently, and Fox rejoined his principal. They returned to the police station where Alain had a word with Sergeant Oliphant. Come on, Fox, we better get moving. Oliphant, have everything laid on, and if you get a signal from me, come at once with suitable assistance. He was very quiet on the way back over Watts Hill. As they turned the summit and approached Jacob's cottage, they saw Mr. Finn leaning over his gate with a kitten on his shoulder. Fox pulled up by the gate and Alain got out. He looked at the pallid face and restless eyes as Mr. Finn took the kitten from his neck and caressed it. Mr. Finn, he said, will you let me have your copy of Chapter 7? The kitten screamed, opening its mouth and showing its tongue. Mr. Finn kissed it and put it down. Forgive me, my atom, he said. Run to mother, he opened the gate. Shall we go in, he suggested, and they followed him into a garden dotted about with rustic furniture. Of course, Alain said, you can refuse. I shall then have to use some other form of approach. Chapter 7, Mr. Finn said, wetting his lips, constitutes for me what may perhaps be described as a contramotive. So I had supposed, Alain said, but don't you think you had better let me see it? There was a long silence. Without the consent of Lady Lacklander, Mr. Finn said, never. Not for all the sleuths in Christendom. Mr. Finn had already turned aside when his garden gate creaked and Alain said quietly, Good morning once again, Lady Lacklander. Mr. Finn spun round. Lady Lacklander stood blinking in the sun without expression and very slightly tremulous. Roderick, said Lady Lacklander, I have come to confess. Lady Lacklander advanced slowly towards them. If that contraption of yours will support my weight, Octavius, she said, I'll take it. They stood aside for her. Mr. Finn suddenly began to gabble. No, 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 no not another word. I, I, I forbid it. She let herself down on a rustic seat. For God's sake, Mr. Finn implored her frantically. Hold your tongue, Lady L. Nonsense, Oki, okay, she rejoined. Hold yours, my good fool. She addressed herself to Alain. I'm here, Roderick, virtually on behalf of my husband. The confession I have to offer is his. At last, Alain said, Chapter 7. Precisely. I've no idea how much you think you already know, or how much you may have been told. By me, Mr. Finn cried out. Nothing! Hoof, she said. Uncommon generous of your Octavius. But we are, as a family, under a certain obligation to you. Lady Lacklander made a brief, comprehensive gesture with her short arms and said, Roderick, my husband was a traitor. <laughs>
They made a strange group sitting there on uncomfortable rustic benches. Fox took unobtrusive notes, Mr. Finn held his head in his hands, Lady Lacklander immobile behind the great facade of her fat talked. At the time of the Zlonitsa incident, my husband was in secret negotiation with a group of Prussian fascists. He was absolutely and traitorously committed to the Nazi program. Alain saw that her eyes were bitter with tears. They never found that out at your MI5, Roderick, did they? No. And yet this morning I thought that perhaps you knew. I wondered, that was all. The extraordinary thing, Mr. Finn said suddenly, is why? Why did Lacklander do it? The Heron Volk heresy, Alain suggested. An aristocratic Anglo-German alliance is the only alternative to war and communism and the only hope for the survival of his own class? It was a popular heresy at that time. No doubt he was promised great things. You don't spare him, Lady Lacklander said under her breath. How can I? In the new Chapter 7, I imagine he doesn't spare himself. He repented bitterly. His remorse was frightful. Yes, Mr. Finn said. That is clear enough. Ah, yes, she cried out. Ah, yes, Arky, yes, and most of all for the terrible injury he did your boy. Most of all for that. Lady Lacklander raised her voice as if she repeated some intolerable lesson. My husband writes that he drove Vicky Finn to his death as surely as if he had killed him with his own hands. He was instructed to do so by his Nazi masters. It was then that he began to understand what he had done and to what frightful lengths his German associates could drive him. But the treachery Oki was ours. Why just now did you try to stop me? It was, if you will believe me, in deference to my boy's wishes, Finn said very quietly. Before he killed himself, Vicky wrote to his mother and to me. He begged us to believe him innocent. He also begged us never to take any action that might injure Sir Harold Lacklander. You may not have noticed, my dear Lady Al, that my foolish boy hero worshipped your husband. We decided to respect his wishes. Mr. Finn stood up. He looked both old and shabby. Now, if I may, I shall ask you to excuse me. And if you want to know what I did with Chapter 7, I burnt it to ashes, my dear Chief Inspector, half an hour ago. He raised his dreadful smoking cap, bowed to Lady Lacklander, and walked into his house, followed by his cats. Lady Lacklander stood up. I am going to Nunn's pardon, she said. Alain opened the gate. She went out without looking at him, got into her great car, and was driven away. Fox said, Painful business. Still, as Mr. Finn says, this Chapter 7 really puts him in the clear, as far as killing Colonel Carteret is concerned. Well, no, Alain said. No? The Colonel left Chapter 7 at Jacob's Cottage. Finn, on his own statement, didn't re-enter the house after his row with the colonel. He returned to the Willow Grove, found the body, and lost his spectacles. He read Chapter 7 for the first time this morning, I fancy by the aid of a magnifying glass. Of course, Fox said as they turned into Commander Sice's drive, it will have been a copy. The colonel would never hand over the original. No. My guess is he locked the original in the bottom drawer on the left-hand side of his desk. And here we go with a particularly odious little interview. Look out for squalls, Br'er Fox. Oh, gosh, see who's here. It was Nurse Kettle. She had emerged from the front door, escorted by Commander Sice. Alain lifted his hat as Nurse Kettle shot past them like a leaping eland. She was extremely red in the face. Fox pulled up and they both got out. Alain slung the golf bag over his shoulder as he addressed himself to Sice. May we speak to you indoors somewhere? Alain asked. Without a word, Sice led the way into his living room where a grim little meal was laid out on a small table in close proximity to a very dark whiskey and water. What's up now? Sice demanded. Alain said, I've come to ask you a number of questions, all of which you will find grossly impertinent. They concern the last occasion when you were in Singapore. 
In a word, I must ask you if you were not in fact on terms of the greatest intimacy with Miss de Vere as she was then. Bloody impudent! Well, yes, but so, when one comes to think of it, is murder. Break grief! Sice exclaimed. I liked Carteret! You may have liked Carteret, but did you love his wife? Love! Sice repeated, turning purple. What a word! You are being difficult, Alain said, without rancor. Will you let me have the clothes you were wearing last evening? What the hell for? For one thing, to see if Carteret's blood is on them. How absolutely piffling! He returned and gave a bundle to Fox, who wrote out a receipt for it. No return, Alain remarked, of the ailment. Sice did not reply. Alain said, Why the devil did you pretend to have lumbago last evening? Was it for the love of a lady? Commander Sice's face darkened to an alarming degree. Well, was it? Alain insisted. Fox clapped the bundle of clothes down on a table. I know what it's like, Commander Sice began incomprehensibly. He waved his hand in the direction of Hammer Farm. Lonely as hell. Poor little kid. Suppose he wanted security. Natural. He eyed the tumbler on his luncheon table. No good offering you a drink, he mumbled. None in the world, worse luck. Well, Sice said. He added something that sounded like luck and drained the tumbler. As a matter of fact, he said, I think I'm giving it up myself. Wow, the hole. He went to a corner cupboard and returned with a half-empty bottle of whiskey. I've got to think, he said. He helped himself to a treble whiskey. In that case, wouldn't you do better without that snorter you've just poured out? Think so? Fox, with his masterly command of the totally unexpected, said, She would. She knows what to do, Commander Sice muttered. If she wants to stop me, or rather she doesn't, I wouldn't tell her. Commander Sice then added in a deeper voice than Alain would have imagined possible for him to produce. Oh, I wouldn't mention it to her on any account whatsoever. Never. I'm afraid you really are very tight. It's the last time so early. In future, I'm going to wait till the sun's over the yard arm. Happens to be a promise. To Miss Kettle? Who else? Sice said grandly. Why not? An admirable idea. She guessed, he added wretchedly. We parted brass rags, so I promised. After today, yard arm. Good luck to it. With the swiftest possible movement, Alain whisked the arrow from the golf bag and held it under Sice's nose. Do you know anything about that? he asked. That's mine. You took it away. No, this was found in Bottom Meadow at the foot of Watts Hill. If you examine it, you'll see there's a difference. Alain whipped the cover off the tip of the arrow. Look, he said. Sice stared owlishly at the point. Bloody, he observed. Looks like it. What blood? Whose blood? Sice thrust his fingers distractedly through his thin hair. Cat's blood, he said. It appears, Alain said as they drove away, that when he's completely plastered he gets a sort of cupid fixation and looses off his shafts blindly into the landscape with a classic disregard for their billets. Can't do anything really conclusive until we get a lead from Curtis. But we interview George Lacklander all the same, Brer Fox, and I hope lay the ghost of young Ludovic Finn. Half past one. We may as well let them have their luncheon. Let's see what they can do for us at the Boy and Donkey. They ate their cold meat, potato and beetroot with the concentration of men whose meals are consumed precariously when chances present themselves. Before they had finished, Dr. Curtis rang up to give an interim report. He now plumbed unreservedly for a blow on the temple with a blunt instrument, while Colonel Carteret squatted over his catch. Subsequent injuries had been inflicted with a pointed instrument after he lay on his side, unconscious or possibly already lifeless. The second injury had all but obliterated the first. He was unable with any certainty to name the first instrument, but the second was undoubtedly the shooting stick. Traces of recently shed blood had been found under the collar of the disc. I see, Alain said, and the shooting stick was used, my dear chap, in the normal way, one must suppose. Yes, one must, mustn't one. Alain turned away from the telephone to discover Sergeant Bailey waiting for him. He had come from a further detail overhaul of Colonel Carteret's study.
The bottom drawer on the left of the desk carried an identifiable fingerprint of Sir George Lacklanders. Very useful, Alain said. Brer Fox, we're going to Nun's pardon. They were taken there by the yard driver who was now released from his duties in Bottom Meadow. The butler admitted them and showed them into George Lacklander's study, the last of the studies they were to visit. George's expression was truculent. I should have thought, I must say, Alain, he said, that one's luncheon hour at least might be left to one. I want, Alain said, the truth. I want the truth about what you did yesterday evening. I want the truth about what you did when you went to Hammer Farm last night. I want the truth, and I think I have it, about Chapter 7 of your father's memoirs. Did you expect to find a copy of Chapter 7 when you broke open the drawer in Colonel Carteret's desk last night? Lacklander made an ineffectual gesture with his hands. I did it at the desire of his family. The keys seemed to be lost, and there were certain things that had to be done. They thought his address book might be there. Was it there? He boggled for a moment and then said, No. I put it to you that it was you who insisted upon doing it because you were in a muck sweat wanting to find out where the amended chapter 7 of your father's memoirs might be. I suggest that you are very well aware of the fact that your father wrote an amended version of chapter 7 which was in effect a confession. In this version, he stated, firstly, that he himself was responsible for young Ludovic Finn's suicide, and secondly, that he himself had traitorously conspired against his own government with certain elements in the German government. This chapter, if it were published, would throw such opprobrium upon your father's name that in order to stop its being made public, I suggest you were prepared to go to the lengths to which you have in fact gone. You are an immensely vain man with a confused, indeed a fanatical sense of your family prestige. Have you anything to say to all this? Most unexpectedly, George Lacklander began to laugh. <laughs> so sorry, he gasped. You don't think that I... He waved away his uncompleted sentence with a flap of his pink freckled hand. That you murdered Colonel Carteret, were you going to say? Such a notion, I mean, how, when, with what? Alain, watching his antics, found them insupportable. <laughs> I know I shouldn't laugh, Lacklander gabbled. But it's so fantastic. How? When? With what? And through Alain's mind dodged a disjointed jingle. Quomodo quando quibus auxilius. He was killed, Alain said, by a blow and a stab. The injuries were inflicted at about five past eight last evening. The murderer stood in the old punt. As for with what? He forced himself to look at George Lacklander, whose face, like a bad mask, was still crumpled in a false declaration of mirth. The puncture, Alain said, was made by your mother's shooting stick, and the initial blow— He saw the pink hands flex and stretch, flex and stretch. By a golf club, probably a driver. At that moment the desk telephone rang. It was Dr. Curtis for Alain. He was still talking when the door opened and Lady Lacklander came in, followed by Mark. Curtis said, Can I talk? Ah, yes, Alain said airily. That's all right. I'm afraid I can't do anything to help you, but you can go ahead quietly on your own. I suppose, Dr. Curtis's voice said very softly, you're in a nest of Lacklanders. Yes, indeed. All right. I've rang up to tell you about the scales. We can't find both types on any of the clothes or gear. No? No, only on the paint rack. Both types on that? Yes, and on the punt seat. Yes? Yes, shall I go on? Do. Dr. Curtis went on. Alain and the Lacklanders watched each other. Nurse Kettle had finished her afternoon jobs in Swevenings, but before she returned to Chining, she thought she should visit the child with the abscess in the gardener's cottage at Hammer Farm. She felt some delicacy about this duty because of the calamity that had befallen the Carterets. Still, she could slip quietly round the house and down to the cottage without bothering anybody, and perhaps the gardener's wife would have a scrap or two of mournful gossip for her about when the funeral was to take place, and what the police were doing and how the ladies were bearing up, and whether general opinion favoured an early marriage between Miss Rose and Dr. Mark. She also wondered privately what, if anything, was being said about Mrs. Carteret and Sir George Lacklander, though her loyalty to the family, she told herself, would oblige her to give a good slapdown to any nonsense that was talked in that direction. As this thought occurred to her, she heard her name called. Hello there, Nurse Kettle.
it was Kitty Carteret sitting out on the terrace with a tea table in front of her. Come and have some, she called. Nurse Kettle was dying for a good cup of tea, and what was more, she had a bone to pick with Kitty Carteret. She accepted and presently was seated before the table. You pour out, Kitty said. Help yourself. She looked exhausted and had made the mistake of overpainting her face. What have you been doing with yourself all day, I wonder? Doing? God, I don't know. This morning for my sins I had to go over to Lacklanders. To Nun's Pardon? Nurse Kettle said with refinement. What a lovely old home it is. The place is all right, Kitty muttered under her breath. Perhaps you prefer Uplands? Kitty stared at her. Uplands? I thought, Nurse Kettle said with mounting colour, you might find the company at Uplands more to your taste than the company at Nun's Pardon. Jeff Sice? Kitty gave a short laugh. <laughs> God, that old bit of wreckage. Have a heart. Nurse Kettle's face was scarlet. If the commander isn't the man he used to be, she said, I wonder whose fault it is. His own, I should think, Kitty said indifferently. Personally, I found it's more often a case of cherche, Nurse Kettle said carefully, la femme. What? When a nice man takes to solitary drink and it's generally because some woman's let him down. Are you suggesting I'm the woman in this case? I'm not suggesting anything, but you knew him out in the East, I believe, Nurse Kettle added with a spurious air of making polite conversation. Oh, yes, Kitty agreed contemptuously. I knew him all right. Did he tell you? Here, what has he told you? She demanded, and unexpectedly there was a note of something like desperation in her voice. Nothing I'm sure that you could take exception to. The commander, whatever you like to say, is a gentleman. How can you be such a fool? Kitty said drearily. Don't talk to me about gentlemen. I've had them, thank you. If you ask me, it's a case of the higher you go, the fewer. Look, Kitty said with savagery, at George Lacklander. Tell me this, Nurse Kettle cried out. Did he love you, the commander? Look, Kitty said, you don't know anything. You don't know a single damn thing. You haven't got a clue. You can't train for nursing, I'll have you know. Oh, well, all right, from that point of view. But from my point of view, honestly, you have no idea. I don't know what we're talking about, Nurse Kettle said in a worried voice. I bet you don't. The commander... She stopped short, and Kitty stared at her incredulously. Do I see, Kitty asked, what I think I see? You don't tell me you and Jeff Sykes. <laughs> God, that's funny. Words, phrases, whole speeches suddenly began to pour out of Nurse Kettle. She had been hurt in the most sensitive part of her emotional anatomy, and her reflex action was surprising. Every word she uttered was spoken in defence of something that she would have been unable to define. It is possible that Nurse Kettle, made vulnerable by her feeling for Commander Sice, a feeling that in her cooler moments she would have classed as unsuitable, felt in Kitty Carteret, overpainted, knowledgeable, fantastically not quite, the sting of implied criticism. It was as if by her very existence Kitty Carteret challenged the hierarchy that was Nurse Kettle's symbol of perfection. So you've no business, she heard herself saying, you've no business to be where you are and behave the way you're behaving. I don't care what's happened. I don't care how he felt about you in Singapore or wherever it was. That was his business. I don't care. When at last Nurse Kettle ran out of words and breath, Kitty turned and stared abstractedly at her. I don't know why you're making such a fuss, she said. Is he game to marry you? Nurse Kettle felt dreadful. I wish I hadn't said anything, she muttered. I'm going. I suppose he might like the idea of being dry, nurse. You've nothing to moan about. Suppose I was friends with him in Singapore. What of it? Go right ahead. Mix in with the bloody county and I hope you enjoy yourself. Don't talk about them like that, Nurse Kettle shouted. Don't do it. You know nothing about them. They're the salt of the earth. With methodical care, Kitty moved the tea tray aside, as if it prevented her in some way from getting at Nurse Kettle, and leaning forward, holding the edges of the table, said, Listen to me.
I ask you to come and sit here because I've got to talk, and I thought you might be partly human. I didn't know you were yes girl to this gang of fossils. God, you make me sick. What have they got except money and snob value that you haven't got? Lot, Nurse Kettle declaimed stoutly. Like hell they have. Okay, I lived with your boyfriend in Singapore. He was bloody dull, but I was in a bit of a jam, and it suited us both. Okay, he introduced me to Mori. Okay, he did it like they do. Look what I've found, and sailed away in his great big boat and got the shock of his life when he came home and found me next door as Mrs. Morris Carteret. So what does he do? He couldn't care less what happened to me, of course. But could he be just ordinary, friendly, and give me a leg up with these survivals from the Ice Age? Not he. He shies off as if I was a nasty smell and takes to the bottle. Not that he wasn't pretty expert at that before. Nurse Kettle made as if to rise, but Kitty stopped her with a sharp gesture. Stay where you are, she said. I'm talking. So here I was, married to a. I don't know what the sort they call a nice chap. He was a real baby, though, more like a mother's darling than an experienced man. It wasn't my cup of tea, but I was down to it. And anyway, his sort owed me something. So we married and came here, and he started writing some god awful book. And Rose and he sat in each other's pockets, and the county called. Yes, they called all right, talking one language to each other and another one to me. Old Ocky Finn, as mad as a meat axe, and doesn't even keep himself clean. The fat woman of Nun's Pardon, who took one look at me and then turned polite for the first time in history. Rose, trying so hard to be nice, it's a wonder she didn't rupture something. The parson and his wife, and half a dozen women dressed in tweed sacks and felt buckets with faces like the backside of a mule. My God, what have they got? They aren't fun. They aren't gay. They don't do anything, and they look like the wreck of the schooner Hesperus. Talk about a living death, and me dumped like a sack, and meant to be grateful. You don't understand. Nurse Kettle began, and then gave it up. Kitty had doubled her left hand into a fist and was screwing it into the palm of the right, a strangely masculine gesture at odds with her enamelled nails. Not one of them, not a damn one, was what you might call friendly. Well, what about Sir George? Nurse Kettle cried, exasperated and rattled into indiscretion. George, George wanted what they all want, and now things have got awkward. He doesn't want that. George, George, the umpteenth baronet is in a muck sweat. George can't think. Kitty said in savage mimicry, "What people might not be saying." He told me so himself. If you knew what I know about George, her face abruptly was as blank as a shuttered house. Everything, she said, has gone wrong. I just don't have the luck. Their fault. You can say what you like, but whatever has happened is their fault. How can you think that? Miss Kettle cried out. What are you suggesting? What are you suggesting? George Lacklander demanded as Alain at last put down the receiver. Who have you been speaking to? What did you mean by what you said to me just now about? He looked round at his mother and son. An instrument, he said. Lady Lacklander said, George, I don't know what you and Roderick have been talking about, but I think it's odds on that you'd better hold your tongue. I'm sending for my solicitor. She grasped the edge of the desk and let herself down into a chair. The folds of flesh under her chin began to tremble. She pointed at Alain. "Well, Rory," she demanded, "what is all this? What are you suggesting?" Alain hesitated for a moment and then said, "At the moment, I suggest that I see your son alone." "No," Mark, looking rather desperate, said. "Gar, don't you think it might be better?" "No," she jabbed her fat finger at Alain. "What have you said, and what were you going to say to George?" I told him that Colonel Carteret was knocked out by a golf club. I'll now add, for the information of you all, since you chose to stay here, that he was finally killed by a stab through the temple made by your shooting stick, Lady Lacklander. Your paint rag was used to wipe the scales of two trout from the murderer's hands. The first blow was made from the punt, 
The murderer, in order to avoid being seen from Watts Hill, got into the punt and slid down the stream using the long mooring rope, as you probably did when you yourself sketched from the punt. The punt, borne by the current, came to rest in the little bay by the willow grove, and the murderer stood in it, idly swinging a club at the daisies growing on the edge of the bank. This enemy of the colonel's was so well known to him that he paid little attention, said something perhaps about the trout he had caught, and went on cutting grass to wrap it in. Perhaps the last thing he saw was the shadow of the club moving swiftly across the ground. Then he was struck on the temple. We think there was a return visit with your shooting stick, Lady Lacklander, and that the murderer quite deliberately used the shooting stick on Colonel Carteret as you used it this morning on your garden path, placed it over the bruised temple, and sat on it. What did you say? Nothing. It's a grotesque and horrible thought, isn't it? We think that on getting up and releasing the shooting stick there was literally a slip, a stumble, you know. It would take quite a bit of pulling out. There was a backward lunge, a heel came down on the colonel's trout. The fish would have slid away, no doubt, if it had not been lying on a sharp, triangular stone. It was trodden down and, as it were, transfixed on the stone. A flap of skin was torn away, and the foot, instead of sliding off, sank in and left an impression, an impression of the spiked heel of a golf shoe. George Lacklander said in an unrecognizable voice, All this conjecture! No, Elaine said, I assure you, not conjecture. He looked at Lady Lacklander and Mark. Shall I go on? Lady Lacklander, using strange, uncoordinated gestures, fiddled with the brooches that, as usual, were stuck about her bosom. Yes, she said. Go on. Mark, who throughout Alain's discourse had kept his gaze fixed on his father, said, Go on. By all means, why not? Right, Alain said. Now the murderer was faced with evidence of identity. One imagines the trout glistening with a clear, spiked heel mark showing on its hide— it wouldn't do to throw it into the stream or the willow grove and run away. There lay the colonel with his hands smelling of fish and pieces of cut grass all around him. For all his murderer knew, there may have been a witness to the catch. This, of course, wouldn't matter as long as the murderer's identity was unsuspected, but there is a panic sequel to most crimes of violence, and it is under its pressure that the fatal touch of over-cleverness usually appears. I believe that while the killer stood there fighting down terror, the memory of the olden lying on bottom bridge arose. Hadn't Danbury Finn and the colonel quarrelled loudly, repeatedly and vociferously quarrelled that very afternoon over the olden? Why not replace the colonel's catch with the fruits of Mr. Finn's poaching tactics and drag not a red herring, but a whacking great trout across the trail? Would that not draw attention towards the known enemy and away from the secret one? So... There was a final trip in the punt. The colonel's trout was removed and the olden substituted. It was at this juncture that fate, in the person of Mrs. Thomasina Twitchett, appeared to come to the murderer's aid. For God's sake! George Lacklander shouted. Stop talking! He half formed an extremely raw epithet, broke off and muttered something indistinguishable. Who are you talking about, Rory? Lady Lacklander demanded. Mrs. Who? Mr. Finn's cat. You will remember Mrs. Carteret told us that in Bottom Meadow she came upon a cat with a half-eaten trout. We have found the remains. There is a triangular gash corresponding with the triangular flap of skin torn off by the sharp stone. And as if justice or nemesis or somebody had assuaged the cat's appetite at the crucial moment, there is also a shred of skin bearing the unmistakable mark of part of a heel and the scar of a spike. But can all this, Mark began, I mean, when you talk of correspondence, our case, Alain said, will I assure you rest upon scientific evidence of an unusually precise character. At the moment I'm giving you the sequence of events. The colonel's trout was bestowed upon the cat. Lady Lacklander's paint rag was used to clean the spike of the shooting stick and the murderer's hands. You may remember, Dr. Lacklander, that your grandmother said she had put all her painting gear tidily away, but you, on the contrary, said you found the rag caught up in a briar bush. You suggest, then, Mark said evenly, that the murder was done sometime between ten to eight when my grandmother went home and a quarter past eight when I went home. He thought for a moment and then said, I suppose that's quite possible. The murderer might have heard or caught sight of me thrown down the rag in a panic and—
taken to the nearest cover only to emerge after I'd picked up the sketching gear and gone on my way. Lady Lacklander said after a long pause, I find that a horrible suggestion. Horrible! I dare say, Alain said. It was an abominable business, after all. You spoke of scientific evidence, Mark said. Alain explained about the essential dissimilarities in individual fish scales. It's all in Colonel Carteret's book, he said, and looked at George Lacklander. You had forgotten that, perhaps. Matter of fact, I... I, I don't know that I ever read poor old Morris's little book. It seems to me to be both charming, Alain said, and instructive. In respect to the scales, it is perfectly accurate. A trout scale, the colonel tells us, are his diary, in which his whole life history is recorded for those who can read them. Only if two fish have identical histories will their scales correspond. Our two sets of scales, luckily, are widely dissimilar. There is Group A, the scales of a nine- or ten-year-old fish who has lived all his life in one environment. And there is Group B, belonging to a smaller fish who, after a slow growth of four years, changed his environment, adopted possibly a seagoing habit, made a sudden spurt of growth, and was very likely a newcomer to the chine. You will see where this leads us, of course. <laughs> Damned if I do, George Lacklander said. Oh, but yes, surely. The people who, on their own and other evidence, are known to have handled one fish or the other are Mr. Finn, Mrs. Carteret, and the Colonel himself. Mr. Finn caught the olden. Mrs. Carteret tells us she tried to take a fish away from Thomasina Twitchit. The colonel handled his own catch and refused to touch the olden. Lady Lacklander's paint rag with the traces of both types of fish scales tell us that somebody, we believe the murderer, handled both fish. The further discovery of minute bloodstains tells us that the spike of the shooting stick was twisted in the rag after being partially cleaned in the earth. If, therefore, with the help of the microscope, we could find scales from both fish on the garments of any one of you, that one will be Colonel Carteret's murderer. That, Alain said, was our belief. Was, Mark said quickly, and Fox, who had been staring at a facetious Victorian hunting print, refocused his gaze on his senior officer. Yes, Alain said. The telephone conversation I've just had was with one of our home office men who are looking after the pathological side. It is from him that I got all this expert stuff about scales. He tells me that on none of the garments submitted are there scales of both types. The normal, purplish color flooded back into George Lacklander's face. I said from the beginning, he shouted, it was some tramp. Though why the devil you had to... to... He seemed to hunt for a moderate word. To put us through the hoops like this... His voice faded. Alain had lifted his hand. Well? Lacklander cried out. What is it? What the hell is it? I beg your pardon, Mama. Lady Lacklander said automatically. Don't be an ass, George. I'll tell you, Alain said, exactly what the pathologist has found. He has found traces of scales where we expected to find them on the colonel's hands and the edge of one cuff, on Mr. Finn's coat and knickerbockers, and, as she warned us, on Mrs. Carteret's skirt. The first of these traces belongs to Group B, and the other two to Group A. Yes? Alain said, looking at Mark, who'd begun to speak and then stopped short. Nothing, Mark said. I... no, go on. I've almost finished. I've said that we think the initial blow was made by a golf club, probably a driver. I may as well tell you at once that so far none of the clubs has revealed any trace of blood. On the other hand, they have all been extremely well cleaned, George said. Naturally, my chap does mine. When it comes to shoes, however, Alain went on, it's a different story. They too have been well cleaned, but in respect of the right foot of a pair of golfing shoes, there is something quite definite. The pathologist is satisfied that the scar left on the colonel's trout was undoubtedly made by the spiked heel of this shoe. It's a bloody lie, George Lacklander bawled out. Who are you accusing? Whose shoe? It's a handmade job, size four, made, I should think, as long as ten years ago, from a very old, entirely admirable and hideously expensive bootmaker in the Burlington Arcade. It's your shoe, Lady Lacklander. Her face was too fat to be expressive. She seemed merely to stare at Alain in a meditative fashion. But she had gone very pale. At last she said without moving, George, it's time to tell the truth. That, Alain said, is the conclusion I hoped you would come to. What are you suggesting?
Nurse Kettle repeated, and then seeing the look in Kitty's face, she shouted, No! Don't tell me! But Kitty had begun to tell her. It's each for himself in their world, she said, just the same as in anybody else's. If George Lacklander dreams he can make a monkey out of me, he's going to wake up in a place where he won't have any more funny ideas. What about the old family name, then? Look! Do you know what he gets me to do? Break open Morris's desk because there's something Morrie was going to make public about old Lacklander and George wants to get in first. And when it isn't there, he asks me to find out if it was on the body. Me! And when I won't take that one on, what does he say? I don't know. Don't tell me. Oh, yes, I will. You listen to this and see how you like it. After all the fun and games teaching me how to swing... She made a curious little retching sound in her throat and looked at Nurse Kettle with a kind of astonishment. You know, she said, golf. Well, so what does he do? He says this morning when he comes to the car with me, he says he thinks it would be better if we don't see much of each other. She suddenly flung out a string of adjectives that Nurse Kettle would have considered unprintable. That's George Lacklander for you, Kitty Carteret said. You are a wicked woman, Nurse Kettle said. I forbid you to talk like this. Sir George may have been silly and infatuated. I dare say you've got what it takes, as they say. And he's a widower. And I always say there's a trying time for a gentleman, just as there is. But that's by the by. What I mean, if he's been silly, it's you that's led him on, Nurse Kettle said, falling back on the inexorable precepts of her kind. You court our dear colonel, and not content with that, you set your cap at poor Sir George. You don't mind who you upset or how unhappy you make other people. I know your sort. You're no good, no good at all. I shouldn't be surprised if you weren't responsible for what's happened. Not a scrap surprised. What the hell do you mean? Kitty whispered. She curled back in her chair and staring at Nurse Kettle, she said, You with your poor Sir George. Do you know what I think about your poor Sir George? I think he murdered your poor dear Colonel, Miss Kettle. Nurse Kettle sprang to her feet. The wrought iron chair rocked against the table. There was a clatter of china and a jug of milk overturned into Kitty Carteret's lap. How dare you? Nurse Kettle cried out. Wicked, wicked, wicked! She heard herself grow shrill, and in the very heat of her passion she remembered an important item in her code, never raise the voice, so, although she would have found it less difficult to scream like a train, she did contrive to speak quietly. Strangely commonplace phrases emerged, and Kitty, slant-eyed, listened to them. "'I would advise you,' Nurse Kettle quavered, "'to choose your words. People can get into serious trouble passing remarks like that,' she achieved an appalling little laugh. "'Murder the Colonel!' she said, and her voice wobbled desperately. The idea, if it wasn't so dreadful, it'd be funny. With what, may I ask, and how? Kitty, too, had risen, and milk dribbled from her ruined skirt to the terrace. She was beside herself with rage. How? she stammered. I'll tell you how, and I'll tell you with what. With a golf club and his mother's shooting stick, that's what. Just like a golf ball it was. Bold and shining, easy to hit, or an egg. Easy! Kitty drew in her breath noisily. Her gaze was fixed not on Nurse Kettle, but beyond Nurse Kettle's left shoulder. Her face was stretched and stamped with terror. It was as if she had laid back her ears. She was looking down the garden towards the spinney. Nurse Kettle turned. The afternoon was far advanced, and the men who had come up through the spinney cast long shadows across the lawn, reaching almost to Kitty herself. For a moment, she and Alain looked at each other, and then he came forward. In his right hand he carried a pair of very small, old-fashioned shoes, brogues with spikes in the heels. Mrs. Carteret, Alain said, I'm going to ask you if, when you played golf with Sir George Lacklander, he lent you his mother's shoes. Before you answer me, I must warn you. Nurse Kettle didn't hear the usual warning. She was looking at Kitty Carteret, in whose face she saw guilt itself. George, Lady Lacklander said to her son, we shall, if you please, get this thing straightened out. There must be no reservations before Mark or— She waved her fat hand at a singularly still figure in a distant chair. 
or Octavius. Everything will come out later on. We may as well know where we are now among ourselves. There must be no more evasions. George looked up and muttered, Very well, Mamma." I knew, of course, his mother went on, that you were having one of your elephantine flirtations with this wretched, unhappy creature. I was afraid that you had been fool enough to tell her about your father's memoirs and all the fuss over Chapter 7. What I must know now is how far your affair with her may be said to have influenced her in what she did. My God, George said, I don't know. Did she hope to marry you, George? Did you say things like, if only you were free to her? Yes, George said. I did. He looked miserably at his mother and added, You see, she wasn't. So it didn't seem to matter. Lady Lacklander snorted, but not with her usual brio. And the memoirs? What did you say to her about them? I just told her about the damned Chapter 7. I just said that if Maurice consulted her, I hoped she'd sort of weigh in on our side, and I... And that was no use. I, I said that if he did publish, you know, it would make things so awkward between the families that we... Well... All right, I see. Go on. She knew he had the copy of Chapter 7 when he went out. She told me that afterwards, this morning. She said she couldn't ask the police about it, but she knew he'd taken it. Lady Lacklander moved slightly. Mr. Finn made a noise in his throat. Well, Oki, she said. Mr. Finn, summoned by telephone and strangely acquiescent, said, My dear Lady Al, I can only repeat what I've already told you. Had you all relied on my discretion, as I must acknowledge Carteret did, there would have been no cause for anxiety on any of your parts over Chapter 7. You have behaved very handsomely, Oki. No, no, he said. Believe me, no. Yes, you have. Put us to shame. Go on, George. I don't know that there is anything more, except... Answer me this, George. Did you suspect her? George put his great elderly hand across his eyes and said, I don't know, Mamma. Not at once. Not last night. Not this morning. She came by herself, you know. Mark called for Rose. I came downstairs and found her in the hall. It seemed queer, as if she'd been doing something odd. From what Rory tells us, she'd been putting my shoes that you'd lent her without my leave in the downstairs cloakroom, Lady Lacklander said grimly. I am completely at a loss, Mr. Finn said suddenly. Naturally you are, Oki, Lady Lacklander told him about the shoes. She felt, of course, that she had to get rid of them. They are the ones I wear for sketching when I haven't got a bad toe, and my poor fool of a maid packed them up with the other things. Go on, George. <sighs> Later on, after Alain had gone and you went indoors, I talked to her. She was sort of different, said poor George. Well, damned hard. Sort of almost suggesting. Well, I mean, it wasn't exactly the thing. I wish you would contrive to be more articulate. She suggested that it wouldn't be long before you'd pay your addresses. Ah, uh, uh, and then... Uh, I suppose I looked a bit taken aback. I don't know what I said, and, and then... Oh, but it was pretty frightful. She sort of began, not exactly hinting, but, well... Hinting, Lady Lacklander said, will do that if the police found Chapter 7, they begin to think that I, that we, that... Yes, George, we understand. Motive. It really was frightful, I, I, I said. I, I thought it would be better if we didn't sort of meet much. It was just that I suddenly felt I couldn't. Only that. I assure you, Mama. I assure you, Octavius. Yes, yes, she said. All right, George. And then when I said that, she suddenly looked. George said this with an unexpected flash. Like a snake. And you, my poor boy, his mother added, look no doubt like the proverbial rabbit. Well, I feel like I've behaved like one anyway, George rejoined with a unique touch of humour. You've behaved very badly, of course, his mother said without rancour. You've completely muddled your values, just like poor Morris himself, only he went still further. 
You led a completely unscrupulous trollop to suppose that if she was a widow, you'd marry her. You would certainly have bored her even more than Port Morris. But Archie will forgive me if I suggest that your title and your money and nun's pardon offered sufficient compensation. You may on second thoughts even have attracted her, George, his mother added. I mustn't, I suppose, underestimate your simple charms. She contemplated her agonized son for a few minutes and then said, oh, It all comes to this, and I said as much to Kettle a few days ago when we were talking. We can't afford to behave shabbily, George. We've got to stick to our own standards, such as they are, and we don't muddle our values. Let's hope Mark and Rose between them will pick up the pieces. She turned to Mr. Finn. If any good has come out of this dreadful affair, Arky, she said, it is this. You have crossed the chine after I don't know how many years, and paid a visit to Nun's pardon. God knows we have no right to expect it. We can't make amends, Arky. We can't pretend to try. And there it is. It's over, as they say nowadays, to you. She held out her hand and Mr. Finn, after a moment's hesitation, came forward to take it. You see, Oliphant, Alain said with his customary air of diffidence, at the outset it tied up with what all of you told me about the colonel himself. He was an unusually punctilious man, oddly formal, the chief constable said, and devilishly polite, especially with people he didn't like or had fallen out with. He'd fallen out with the Lacklanders. One couldn't imagine him squatting on his haunches and going on with his job if Lacklander or his mother turned up in the punt, or old Finn, with whom he'd had a flaring row. Then, as you and Gripper pointed out, the first injury had been the sort of blow that is struck by a quarryman on a peg projecting from a cliff face at knee level, or by an underhand service, or, you might have added, by a golfer. It seemed likely, too, that the murderer knew the habit of the punt, and the contracurrent of the chine, and the fact that where the punt came to rest in the Willow Grove Bay, it was completely masked by trees. You will remember that we found one of Mrs. Carteret's distinctive yellow hairpins in the punt in close association with a number of cigarette butts, some with lipstick and some not. Ah, Sergeant Oliphant said, dalliance, no doubt. No doubt. When I floated down the stream into the little bay and saw how the daisy heads had been cut off and where they lay, I began to see also a figure in the punt idly swinging a club, a figure so familiar to the colonel that after an upward glance and a word of greeting, he went on cutting grass for his fish. Perhaps, urged by George Lacklander, she asked her husband to suppress the alternative version to Chapter 7, and perhaps he refused. Perhaps Lacklander, in his infatuation, had told her that if she was free, he'd marry her. Perhaps anger and frustration flooded suddenly up to her savage little brain and down her arms into her hands. There was that bald head, like an immense exaggeration of the golf balls she had swiped at under Lacklander's infatuated tuition. She had been slashing idly at the daisies. Now— she made a complete backswing, and in a moment her husband was curled up on the bank with the imprint of her club on his temple. From that time on, she became a murderess, fighting down her panic, and frantically engaged in the obliteration of evidence. The print of the golf club was completely wiped out by her nightmare performance with the shooting stick, which she had noticed on her way downhill. She tramped on the colonel's trout, and there was the print of her spiked heel on its hide, she grabbed up the trout and was frantic to get rid of it when she saw Mr. Finn's cat. One could imagine her watching to see if Thomasina would eat the fish, and her relief when she found that she would. She'd seen the old and on the bridge. No doubt she heard at least the fortissimo passages of Finn's quarrel with the colonel. Perhaps the old and would serve as false evidence. She fetched it and put it down by the body, but in handling the great trout, she let it brush against her skirt. Then she replaced the shooting stick. Lady Lacklander's painting rag was folded under the strap of her rucksack. Kitty Carteret's hands were fishy. She used the rag to wipe them. Then, although she was about to thrust the shooting stick back into the earth, she saw probably round the collar of the spike horrible traces of the use she had made of it.
She twisted it madly about in the rag, which was, of course, already extensively stained with paint. No doubt she would have refolded the rag and replaced it, but she heard may even have seen Dr. Lacklander. She dropped the rag and bolted for cover. When she emerged, she found he had taken away all the painting gear. Alain paused and rubbed his nose. I wonder, he said, if it entered her head that Lady Lacklander might be implicated. I wonder exactly when she remembered that she herself was wearing Lady Lacklander's shoes. He looked from Fox to Oliphant and the attentive gripper. When she got home, he said, no doubt she at once bathed and changed. She put out her tweed skirt to go to the cleaners. Having attended very carefully to the heel, she then polished Lady Lacklander's shoes. I think that heel must have worried her more than anything else. She guessed that Lacklander hadn't told his mother he'd borrowed the shoes. As we saw this morning, she had no suitable shoes of her own, and her feet are very much smaller than her stepdaughter's. She drove herself over to Nun's Pardon this morning, and instead of ringing, walked in and put the shoes in the downstairs cloakroom. I suppose Lady Lacklander's maid believed her mistress to have worn them and accordingly packed them up with her clothes instead of the late Sir Harold's boots which she had actually worn. Fox said, When you asked for everybody's clothes, Mrs. Carteret remembered, of course, that her skirt would smell of fish. Yes, she'd put it in the box for the dry cleaning. When she realised we might get hold of the skirt, she remembered the great trout brushing against it. With a mixture of bravado and cunning, which is, I think, very characteristic, she boldly told me it would smell of fish and had the nerve and astuteness to use Thomasina as a sort of near-the-truth explanation. She only altered one fact. She said she tried to take a fish away from a cat, whereas she had given a fish to a cat. If she'd read her murdered husband's book, she'd have known that particular cat wouldn't jump, and the story was, in fact, a bit too fishy. The scales didn't match. Oliphant said suddenly, It's a terrible thing to happen in the Vale. Terrible the things that'll come out. How's Sir George going to look? He's going to look remarkably foolish, Alain said with some heat, which is no more than he deserves. He's behaved very badly, as his mother has no doubt pointed out to him. What's more, he's made things beastly and difficult for his son, who's a good chap, and for Rose Carteret, who's a particularly nice child. I should say Sir George Lacklander has let his side down. Of course, he was no match at all for a woman of her hardihood. He'd have been safer with a puff adder than Kitty Carteret, nay, heaven help her, de Vere. What, sir, do you reckon? Oliphant began, and catching sight of his superior's face was silent. Alain said harshly, The case will rest on expert evidence of a sort never introduced before. If her counsel is clever and lucky, she'll get an acquittal. If he's not so clever and a bit unlucky, she'll get a lifer. He looked at Fox. Shall we go? he said. He thanked Oliphant and Gripper for their work and went out to the car. Oliphant said, Something up to set the chief, Mr. Fox. Oh, don't you worry. It's the kind of case he doesn't fancy. Capital charge and a woman. Gets to thinking about what he calls first causes. First causes? Oliphant repeated dimly. Society. Civilization or something, Fox said. Mustn't keep him waiting. So long. Darling, darling Rose, Mark said. We're in for a pretty ghastly time, I know. But we're in for it together, my dearest love. And I'll watch over you and be with you, and when it's all done with, we'll have each other and love each other more than ever before, won't we? Won't we? Yes, Rose said, clinging to him. We will, won't we? So that something rather wonderful will come out of it all, Mark said. I promise it will. You'll see. As long as we're together. That's right, Mark said. Being together is everything. And with one of those tricks that memory sometimes plays on us, Colonel Carteret's face, as Mark had last seen it in life, rose up clearly in his mind. It wore a singularly compassionate smile. Together, they drove back to Nun's Pardon. Nurse Kettle drove in bottom gear to the top of Watts Hill and there paused. On an impulse, or perhaps inspired by some unacknowledged bit of wishful thinking, she got out and looked down on the village of Swevenings. Dusk had begun to seep discreetly into the valley. Smoke rose in cosy plumes from one or two chimneys. Roofs cuddled into their surrounding greenery. It was a circumspect landscape 
Nurse Kettle revived her old fancy. As pretty as a picture, she thought wistfully and was again reminded of an illustrated map. With a sigh, she turned back to her faintly trembling car. She was about to seat herself when she heard a kind of strangulated hail. She looked back, and there, limping through the dusk, came Commander Sice. The nearer he got to Nurse Kettle, the redder in the face they both became. She lost her head slightly, clambered into her car, turned her engine off, and turned it on again. Put yourself together, Kettle, she said, and leaning out, shouted in an unnatural voice, This is the top of the evening to you! Commander Sice came up with her. He stood by the open driving window, and even in her flurry she noticed that he no longer smelt of stale spirits. Ha <laughs> ha, he said, laughing hollowly. Sensing, perhaps, that this was a strange beginning, he began again. Look here, he shouted. Good Lord, I just heard. Sickening for you. Are you all right? Not too upset and all that. What a thing. Nurse Kettle was greatly comforted. She had feared an entirely different reaction to Kitty Carteret's arrest in Commander Sice. What about yourself? she countered. Must be a bit of a shock to you, after all. He made a peculiar dismissive gesture with the white object he carried. Never mind me, or rather, Commander Sice amended, dragging feverishly at his collar. If you can bear it for a moment. She now saw that the object was a rolled paper. He thrust it at her. There you are, he said. It's nothing, whatever. Don't say a word. She unrolled it, peering at it in the dusk. Oh, she cried in an ecstasy. How lovely! How lovely! It's my picture map! Oh, look! There's Lady Lacklander sketching in Bottom Meadow, and the doctor with a stalk over his head. Aren't you a trick? And there's me! Only you've been much too kind about me. She leant out of the window, turning her lovely map towards the fading light. This brought her close-ish to Commander Sice, who made a singular little ejaculation and was motionless. Nurse Kettle traced the lively figures through the map. The landlord, the parson, various rustic celebrities. When she came to Hammer Farm, there was the gardener's cottage and his child, and there was Rose bending gracefully in the garden. Nearer the house one could see even in that light, Commander Sice had used thicker paint. As if, Nurse Kettle thought with a jolt, there had been an erasure, and down in the willow grove, the colonel's favourite fishing haunt, there had been made a similar erasure. I started it, he said, some time ago after your... after your first visit. She looked up, and between this oddly assorted pair, a silence fell. Give me six months, Commander Sy said. To make sure, it'll be all right. Will you? Nurse Kettle assured him that she would. Mm -hmm.